Good evening, everybody. I'm Audrey Morris. I'm the co-president of the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland, a co-sponsor um, of this uh, forum this evening. Um, with Election Day looming, we're taking any and all opportunities to talk with voters about how much their voice matters and help people make sure that their voter registration is up to date and get them the information that they need to cast a vote. The League wants to make sure that you check your voter registration or that you register if you haven't registered yet. We have um, people outside that are conducting voter registration, so you can, you can check your registration, you can register if you're not registered already, or you can uh, request a vote by mail ballot also. And we have, uh, yeah, the vote by mail ballots. We have information about vote 411 and, uh, you know, the dates for voting, and we have um, bookmarks that are very handy because it has our vote 411, which is, which is our online voter's guide, which is really an amazing resource where you can just put in your address and get all the information that will be on your ballot. So with it, I'd like to thank you for coming. And uh, Angela, I guess you're going to introduce Henry. Good evening, everyone. My name is Angela Woodson. I'm the political action chair for the Cleveland branch of the NAACP. And I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator for this evening. Mr. Harry Boomer has over 30 years of broadcast news experience and is a 2007 Broadcasters Hall of Fame inductee. He has been an anchor, reporter, host, and executive producer with WOIO slash WUAB television since 1990. Mr. Boomer has served as president of the Cleveland chapter of the National Association of Black Journalists and has been on the board of the Ohio Associated Press. Harry has called Greater Cleveland home since 1990 and is, and is proud to live in the historical Huff neighborhood in Cleveland. Please welcome Harry Boomer. Angela, thank you. Good evening, everyone. How are you? All right. There are a few of us here, but where two or three are gathered, everything is going to be just fine, right? We're going to do what we do, talk about what we need to talk about, and uh, make some change and get people out to the polls. Again, I want to thank uh, everybody for inviting me, the League of Women Voters, the Cleveland NAACP, um, the uh, League of Women Voters, and of course, uh, thanks for hosting us here at this wonderful center here in Cleveland Heights. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists in just a little bit. We'll get right into that. But let me just, we're going to try and make this, as we have tried in the past, to make this a, a nonpartisan discussion about voting and voting rights. And uh, if you have a statement, we're going to ask on these uh, little cards in, event, in a little while to write things down. And please, if you will, print them legibly so I can read them. And uh, then we'll try to get your questions uh, to the table and answer it as well. I would also ask that you do me the favor of taking this thing called the smartphone and turning it down or turning it off or on vibrate. Uh, this has the computing power enough to run the space station. It is called the smartphone, but it is not smart enough to not ring at an inopportune time. So if you would please uh, take your time and uh, turn down or off your smartphone. And also, let me just say in the offsetting here, starting out, that voting is such an important issue, something that we all have a responsibility to do as citizens of this great state and of this great nation. And it is important also to remember the history of what many have gone through for just the right to vote. Uh, women were not allowed to vote initially in this country. African Americans were not allowed to vote. The struggle has been long and mighty and steadfast, and those, um, the right to vote is still under attack today. I say that because I want to vary from the um, program just a little bit and introduce somebody who I think uh, is emblematic of why it's important, who has been a witness to history. And I want to just tell you tonight, we have in the audience someone who stood up for voting and voting rights when she was only seven years old, uh, Cassandra Tate, and will you please just stand for us. Cassandra Tate grew up in Selma, Alabama in 19... 
In 1965, Voting Rights Act were still being suppressed uh, despite the passage of the Civil Rights Act a year before. On March the 7th, 600 marchers were voting for the right. Uh, they were attacked by state troopers, that says in Alabama, on the, uh, and came to known as Bloody Sunday. On March 21st, the third attempt to cross the Pettus Bridge, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, uh, Miss Tate was among the young children who waited at the end of the bridge as the civil rights activists started their march to the state capitol. And we all know what happened there and how difficult a time it was and a pivotal time it was in American history. And we thank you for being here. We thank you for standing up then even as a child. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, my father was a Baptist minister, and I won't go there very much, but, but say that I remember hearing in the church all of my life the teacher child in the way that he or she should go, and when they're older, they would not depart from it. We thank you very much for still being in the struggle, all right? And we often say that the children are our future, and I think we all believe that, but in order for that to happen, they must also be our now. We cannot not love them now through the things they're going through right now. So they won't have to fight the battles that we are still fighting today, uh, some 50 plus years after we thought everything was okay. With that in mind, let me go ahead and start with uh, the rest of the, um, rest of the uh, uh, program. And I'd like to have uh, Angela Woodson, who just came up, to come back up and talk to a little bit about uh, the uh, NAACP and what it is doing about uh, the voting number. She was on a show that I do over at uh, Channels 19 and 43 called CW 43 Focus. And she said something to me then on that show that literally blew my mind. I won't steal her thunder, but I will ask her to talk about the numbers, Angela, that you talked about then. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the podium, Ms. Angela Woodson. Yeah, he put me on the spot. I kind of didn't come with all of my notes for that. Um, but part of the NAACP Cleveland branch focus has been really um, improving on our civil rights here in the Cleveland area. Um, we are a branch that is growing steadily, so if you're interested in joining, our membership team is back there, Donna and uh, Ms. Frances Blunt. Um, but we are definitely fighting. If you remember when um, the, the Tamir Rice situation, our criminal justice committee worked very hard to expose that to get Judge Adrian to even write a briefing about some of the police violence uh, situation that was going on as far as racial profiling. All of that kind of falls on our lap to even some of the discrimination that goes on within schools, which is unfortunate that we're in 2018 and these things still exist. So the things that we think that happened in the 50s and the 60s are reality today. And it's, it's so much better when we all work together, as they did then, as we do need to now. Um, but part of my hat within the NAACP with political action, I've been exposing numbers of voting. And I got concerned because when President Obama ran, we saw lines that were just unbelievable in this county. I don't remember, as a kid, seeing lines like that and couldn't tell you when, at just polling locations, not just downtown at the Board of Elections. And then it seemed to be a drop off. And it seemed to keep dropping off. So what we got to see was in our county, we have like over 884,000 registered voters. And then you have what turned out this past May is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the purge. Everybody I know is caught up in the purge. But I've kind of been caught up what is today, what's right now. And so with 884,000 registered voters, this past May, we were only able to get like 272,000 out. And we have 53 municipalities in this county. So I started saying, this is not just an African-American minority issue. This is really a diverse issue. Somehow we are disconnected and using that power we have that's absolutely free to vote. And so somehow, we need to leave today feeling motivated, regardless how big or large the room is. I always tell people, we have the power to go and leave this room and call five other people, and, file, and not let them call five other people. Because this election is crucial. Midterms are crucial. And it means a lot that people turn out and vote. And even though people say, oh, I don't like the candidates, guess what, there are issues on this ballot. 
There is an issue on this ballot that's going to change a lot of people's lives, and a lot of, our, a lot of their fate is riding on this issue this November. And some people have school levies. Like I said, there's 53 municipalities. If you don't show up and vote, how do you expect schools to have the finances that they need? So I know sometimes we get stuck on the candidates, the partisan issues, but we have real everyday issues, legislative policy matters that come up on these ballots, and we can't afford to miss that. So just keep that in mind, 80, 884,000 registered voters. How do we even come close to that number for this November? Angela, thank you. I know it was an impromptu request to have you come up, but I thought it was important to put this in some perspective because we really cannot afford not to vote. Uh, I contend that the one person, one vote is the only time that we in America are equal. I can only cast one vote on election day. You can only cast one vote on election day. The Koch brothers can only cast one vote on election day. One each, by the way. All right? <laughs> so, uh, it's just so important that we sear in our minds how important it is to get out and vote, to motivate not only ourselves, even if it's a rainy, cold, snowy, icy, inclement weather, a sunshiny day, that day will pass. But if you don't get up and vote what you don't vote on, and the person that gets into office, if they are voting against your best interest, that is going to have years of repercussions. So always please remember the responsibility, the obligation, the right that people fought and died for, for everybody to have the right to vote. So we're going to talk about why should I vote, what's at stake in the November elections. And to do that, we have some uh, very esteemed guests, and I want to thank them for showing up this evening. There's so many other things that they could be doing, so many other places they could be. They could be at home watching PBS and watching the recounting of the um, hearing that went on in Washington today. Uh, but again, we're going to try and keep it uh, bipartisan or nonpartisan. And let me introduce each of our guests. At my far left, you know him as Judge Michael Nelson. He was elected judge of the Cleveland Municipal Court in November of 2017. Uh, Michael, as I know him, graduated from Cleveland Glenville High School in 1967 and immediately applied for and was accepted at, Cleveland, at Central State University. Upon graduation from Central State in 72, Michael returned to Cleveland and joined the Cleveland Public Schools as a teacher. In 1986, Michael fulfilled a personal goal when he entered the Case Western Reserve University School of Law, from which he graduated in 1989. Michael's civic involvement was recognized by the Ohio governors George Vornovich and Bob Taft, who appointed him to successive terms at Central State University as a board of trustee. And the Cleveland mayors Michael White, Jane Campbell, also appointed him to the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District and the Civil Service Commission of the City of Cleveland. Mike has served as a president of Central State University, the National Alumni Association. He's the founding president of 100 Black Men of Greater Cleveland. And he is, uh, was the president of the Cleveland branch of the National Association of uh, Colored People, the NAACP. Uh, Michael's honors include the Thurgood Marshall Fund Alumnus of the Year, the Central State University Alumnus of the Year, and induction to the Central State University Alumni Achievement Hall of Fame. He is the proud father of four. He has four grand sons, two granddaughters, and a great-grandson. Would you please put your hands together for Judge Michael Nelson. <laughs> Got to shuffle a couple of papers here. Sitting next to Judge Nelson is Camille Winbish. She is director of the Ohio Voter Rights Coalition, a coalition of nonprofit voting advocate organizations. She received her JD from the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law and her bachelor's degree from Smith College. Will you please put your hands for Ms. Camille Winbish? <laughs> to my immediate left is Mike Brickner. He's currently the Ohio State Director of All Voting is Local a group dedicated to ensuring the right and ability uh, to vote at all levels. They help communities, and particularly communities of color, identify and remedy barriers to the ballot box. So please put your hands together for Mr. Brickner. 
And what I'm going to do is give each of them three to five minutes to sort of tell us a bit more about who they are and what they do and why they are here. And then we'll get you involved in just a little bit. But Mr. Brigner, since I called you last, I'm not going to call you first. Uh, that, that's totally fine. I'm ready to go. I'm very excited to be here um, talking about these issues uh, here tonight. As uh, Mr. Boomer was uh, saying, um, I'm with All Voting is Local. Uh, if you've not heard of our organization, that's okay, because we've only been around for like two months. Uh, <laughs> so it is a new initiative uh, that was spearheaded by the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights. Uh, if you haven't heard of the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, uh, they're a DC-based uh, civil rights and human rights organization. They've been around for decades. Um, my favorite fun fact about them is that they actually helped to write the Voting Rights Act back in 1965. Um, I'm trying to get that added on to my business card because I think that's very cool. Um, and the uh, All Voting is Local campaign is also supported by the ACLU National, uh, the American Constitution Society, Campaign Legal Center, and the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under the law. And part of why we are starting this new campaign, and we've focused on Ohio uh, and four other states, is because we recognize that the right to vote uh, is still in danger in this country, and that the uh, places that we have typically placed our trust in expanding and defending the right to vote are failing us. Um, you know, we had the U.S. Supreme Court that uh, has essentially gutted the Voting Rights Act uh, a few years ago. Um, we have the Supreme Court that just upheld uh, voter purging here in Ohio and across the country. Um, we have Congress who has not passed um, any good laws on voting rights, much less much other good laws. Uh, uh, we have a Department of Justice that has been um, antagonistic towards voting rights. And we also have a state house that has not uh, advanced a whole lot of positive, proactive measures on voting rights. And so we really recognize that there was an opportunity here to begin to work locally. That every single day there are decisions that local election officials make, uh, local government officials, and local civic groups uh, that either help to enfranchise a person or may keep them away from the ballot box. And so some of the work that we're doing uh, are things like going into uh, the local jails uh, here in Cuyahoga County, but also other places, um, and helping to facilitate voting in those jails. Um, helping to make sure that people who are coming out of jail and prison who do have the right to vote know that they have the right to vote, and if they need to re-register to vote, ensuring that they're going to re-register. Um, also helping to enfranchise people with disabilities, that uh, people with disabilities face architectural barriers every day when they go to polling places that are not accessible to them, uh, and they need to oftentimes then ask for accommodations. But they also face attitudinal barriers that people with disabilities are still told or presumed by some people out there in the community that they don't have the right to vote. And in fact, they do. And so we are helping to empower and educate folks with disabilities so that they know what their rights are and that they're able to assert their rights and able to uh, cast a ballot. Um, but those are just some of the examples of things that we're doing on the local level. Um, I would challenge us that uh, there is a lot at stake on the ballot. And we absolutely should go vote uh, this year, November 6th. Um, but I, I think the title of this talk, Why Should I Vote? It's a good question. But it should also be, what else should I do besides just voting? Um, that if we all just go and cast our ballots on November 6th, and uh, however the election turns out, it turns out, um, we've only taken like the first step in terms of changing our government and making sure that the government is reflecting our, uh, our, our, our wants and our needs. Uh, and that we also have to think about 
what are we going to do after the election? What steps am I going to take to uh, make sure that my elected officials are representing my beliefs? And what am I going to do to make sure that they're held accountable so that they are actually uh, doing what they were elected to do? What we try and do is uh, give you an opportunity to talk further about that as we get on Absolutely. into the evening. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brickner. Uh, Camille Winbish, if you will, please. And I'm starting the clock. I didn't do it before. Here we go. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. I know there's a number of places you could all be. Um, my name is Camille Wimbish. I work with an organization called the Ohio Voter Rights Coalition, which is actually sort of a broad coalition of uh, state, national, and um, local organizations that are working together to figure out ways to modernize our elections and to make it so that everyone is able to have, uh, have access to the ballot and to make sure that their ballots are actually um, secure. And so we have a number of community partners, such as uh, All Voting is Local, the NAACP, the League of Women Voters of Ohio, and the various chapters all around the state. We work with student organizations, the Campus Vote Project. We work with good government organizations like Common Cause, um, environmental organizations. We're really just, we work with other nonprofits all around the state who are looking to do civic engagement work because we know that we can't do this alone. We have, to, we have to work together, we have to pull our resources and pull our people and pull our messages so that we can get out um, into the community with trusted messengers, all encouraging people to be active and um, to get educated on what's at stake with the ballot. So this fall, we are focused on our election protection program. Um, election protection is a nonpartisan program um, it's a national program with the 866-hour OUR vote hotline, and that's a number where people can call if they have questions at the polls, if they want to know what ID they need to bring, or if they have encounter problems at the polls. Maybe the lines are really long. Maybe the poll worker's telling them they're not on the rolls and they know that they're registered to vote. Um, so we're here providing people on the ground and assistance. We also have lawyers who are there to intervene if, if there are problems at the polls. Um, so if you guys are interested in, you know, learning more about it, come see me. We're, we'd be happy to fold you into the program. Um, we are also trying to really get people to pay attention to what's on the ballot when it comes to judges. Um, we've got these um, judicial votes, actually, judge for yourself cards that, that we are circulating to do a fair courts project where we're just trying to make people aware that, you know, it's, judges are so important. They impact so many areas of our lives, and yet, Oftentimes, people skip voting for judges, or they simply go on, you know, whose yard sign looks the coolest. Um, and we're really just trying to get the word out there that there's so much at stake, and we're trying to make sure everyone is educated. So thank you for doing your part in showing up today, and just ask you again to go out and tell those five people um, some of the things that you learned here so that we can spread the word. Thank you, Ms. Winbish. I appreciate it very much. We'll go next to Judge Michael Nelson. Uh, you heard his extensive resume. I sort of skipped over a lot of it, but uh, if you could, sir, just sort of uh, tell us who you are and where you're from and, and, and what it is you want us to know. I'm actually sitting here for Tom Roberts, who's the state president of the uh, uh, Ohio branches of the NAACP, and uh, uh, Angie Woodson, who is our political action committee, asked me to come and stand in for him because he couldn't, couldn't make it today. But you've already heard why we should vote. And uh, uh, thanks to Harry, he did, uh, ran through my bio. Uh, let me, I'm gonna switch up just a little bit in my 30 or 40 seconds. Our country is 242 years old. Uh, for the minorities in the office, in the, in the meeting, that really takes on an additional significance because of, out of that 200, and, and women, it, it, it's important for uh, what I'm saying is relevant to women as well. Out of that 242 years, African Americans have only been able to vote since 1965, which is about, what, 50, 50, 60 something years? So this franchise is really a unique franchise. And women suffrage is also something that is short term. So out of the 240 years, the majority of people in this room have been able to vote for less than a third of the existence of this country. My, mother, my grandmother was born in 1907. Her grandmother was born in 1869. So out of the two of them, 
their voting experience was extremely limited. And they were all in Florida and Tennessee and Georgia. So the, the, the franchise it tried to get people to understand the blood, sweat, and tears that, uh, that really underscores this franchise. The pro Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation was 1863, and we really couldn't play a role in the governance of the country, even though we were emancipated. So it was like we were emancipated to unemployment, uh, and disenfranchised. Our disenfranchisement lasted 102 years beyond our emancipation. So that sort of gives you an under, uh, just an idea of how important the, uh, when people don't want you to participate in something, it must be for a reason. And the fight to keep blacks and women out of the franchise uh, was such a significant fight. And it must have been for a reason. And we see the reasons now, because being allowed to vote turned the country around and it made our democracy that much stronger. But we're about to lose our democracy for two reasons, I think. To be a truly democratic society, you have to have educated people of good judgment. And we've lost that. Most of our urban community, urban schools throughout the country, uh, civics is no longer a, a science that is a subject that is taught. And so the importance of voting is lost on a lot of us. And then the rules that have made it so difficult for people to, by 2020, I don't know how any urbanite is going to be able to get, a, get any idea to allow them to vote. It's going to be so difficult. But then my final comment is that we look at voting as those who don't vote vis-a-vis -vis those that do vote, when there's a third group that we have to go back and get those, that group is those who really don't give a hoot about voting. And they don't give a hoot about voting because they're uneducated. They conscientiously said, I am not voting. And the reasons are multitudinous. You know, it doesn't work for me. I just don't see the value in it. So we have to figure out a way to re-educate that significant group of people who said that, you know, voting I don't feel like being bothered, not interested, don't talk to me about it. As well as those who, and those are people who conscientiously have withdrawn from the process. Sort of reminds me of how we look at unemployment. Those who are looking for jobs, those who recently lost, and those who we don't count because they've been unemployed so long that they're no longer considered a number. And that's what we have as a third group of voters. So uh, I just want to put that out there as we begin our, our discussion about this is why it's so important to vote. And then I'm going to have a conversation about this. Judge for yourself. Now, this says no reflection on the people sitting next to me, but the African American judges are about to go after this very hard. You may have read a couple of articles in the paper. Elizabeth Sullivan has just written one about the credibility of Judge for Yourself. African American preachers went right at it because African Americans have been judged, evaluated, whether regardless of incumbency or experience, two number grades less than Caucasian candidates and judges, regardless of incumbency or experience. And in fact, we have a meeting coming up with Elizabeth Sullivan where, and it's not a sour grapes thing because everybody's going to be meeting with Elizabeth one. But we're going to have, we're having a serious discussion about this whole judge for yourself process. And if you read the last article by Elizabeth Sullivan, she questioned the credibility and the transparency of the process. There was a young man named Brad Bart Hull or Bert Hull or something who was given a zero. And we African Americans have been talking about this a long time, but because it was a young white man, they finally decided to say, maybe we better look at this. He was given a zero ranking, even though he's been a practicing attorney for years, by the bar associations. Um, there's another instance where uh, the, the, there was a straight conflict. Annette Butler, who was a federal prosecutor in the civil division and a law school professor got a zero recommendation for judge for yourself when she ran a couple of years ago, if you remember that. That's impossible. So we've started to say we got to look at this thing. So Harry, let me hand it back to you. That's, we raised just a couple of issues for us to consider tonight. All right, sir. Thank you. You're only 25 seconds over. That's not bad. All right. Appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> me, that's oh, that's bad. my wife, Donna. Harry, she just sent me a text that they don't never recognize the fact you're married. Donna, she sent me that text. That's Donna over there. Donna That's Kelso wife, Nelson Donna. right there at the NAACP table. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Uh, 
Miss See, Frances she, Blount. She, yes, she got on my case for not saying hello earlier. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, since we're recognizing people, let me uh, take the privilege, the MC's privilege of recognizing a friend who's in the house here. This is Fred D'Ambrosi. He's my former boss at Channels 19 and 43. Came out to support a brother. Thank you. His wife, Libba, thank you very much. And she is the one who brought Miss Tate and her daughter here this evening. So thank all of you for being here to support this effort. Let me also remind you that we I will pass out these cards. So if you have a question or comment, basically a question, uh, Mike here has them right there, and he'll be able to pass them out. Uh, please, if you could make it a a question and not a statement, and please print so that it is legible. It would be greatly appreciated. Let me go back to the panel here and just ask, uh, in terms of, again, in the spirit of uh, being nonpartisan as best we can, given the climate that we find ourselves in nationally and locally, um, what do you see as a remedy to some of the voting barriers that we have today? And talk just a little bit about that, because uh, as Mike said, 1965 is not that long ago. Uh, only 50, was it 53 years ago uh, in, in my lifetime, uh, I got the right to vote uh, again. But I appreciate the fact that it is there. So some of the barriers you see and some of the solutions, I think we mostly know the barriers, but let's talk solutions now. And Mr. Brickner, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, and I, I think it's a great point that it's only been since 1965 with the Voting Rights Act that we've seen um, people of color in particular be uh, fully enfranchised in this country. And it's also important to recognize that uh, the 2016 presidential election was the first presidential election since 1965 that we did not have the full protections of the Voting Rights Act. And so when we talk about, um, you know, there was, a after the election, there was a lot of uh, shaming and blaming of people saying, oh, well, you know, we didn't have turnout from uh, the African American community, and that's why Hillary Clinton didn't win. But look at what was going on in the country, that there were uh, concerted efforts um, in many of the same places that the Voting Rights Act was intended to uh, prevent uh, 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 bad actions uh, to prevent uh, people of color from casting their ballots. Um, I think we can look at even what's going on here in Ohio, where we have uh, our voter purging system that has been uh, affirmed by the U.S. Supreme Court. And if you look at who uh, is likely to be purged, um, there are several uh, social science uh, think tanks and reporters and journalists that have looked at this, they have found that you're more likely to be purged if you move frequently, if you're low income, and if you are in a neighborhood that is predominantly African American. So if you look at the city of Cincinnati, if you look at white sub suburbs, you only have about a 4% likelihood of being on the purge list. If you live in a black suburb, you have an 11% uh, likelihood of being purged. And so you know, we see these types of, uh, of efforts being put down, and maybe they're not uh, directly a poll tax or a literacy, uh, a literacy test, but they have the same effect. Um, but I'm very happy that there are solutions to this. Um, I think that, number one, we as a public have to really believe that voting is a right. It's not just a privilege. It's something that we are entitled to and that we need to assert and that it needs to be as free and fair and open and accessible as possible. Um, Camille uh, and I uh, worked on um, this really great uh, set of documents here. Um, it's a, we have a one-pager and then a longer form document, but it sets out really a proactive vision for what we want to see out of Ohio's election system. So it has things like adopting automated voter registration. So this means when you go to a government office, not just the BMV, but other government office like Department of Job and Family Services, maybe your probation or your parole office, uh, maybe your uh, Department of Disabilities office, that if you interact with them, unless you opt out, your information will be sent to uh, register you to vote. 
And so uh, it, it makes sure that people are in the system. It makes it incredibly easy and convenient. And it also makes our system more accurate that if you're taking data from a government uh, database and putting it into the voter registration system, you're more likely to have uh, data that's actually really good and that you can clean up and make sure that your uh, uh, database is correct and that our roles are accurate and up to date. Um, we also recommend increasing early voting opportunities. Uh, I think Angela had mentioned before about having long lines, and I think many of us remember that in the 2000 and 2004 elections. And Ohio did institute uh, no-fault absentee voting, so we didn't have to have an excuse to vote by mail. And we brought about early in-person voting, and we had Golden Week where you could register and vote at the same time. There were some pushes against that, uh, and we saw where there had where there was legislation passed, where there had to be litigation over it. Um, we've now had early in-person voting and vote by mail for a while, but we can actually make them better. One thing that many people don't know is that the uh, settlement agreement that established early in-person voting hours expires as soon as John Houston is no longer Secretary of State. So the next Secretary of State is going to decide, are we gonna have evening and weekend early voting hours? And think about what communities rely on those evening and weekend hours and need them in order to cast an early ballot. Um, so that's an incredibly important thing uh, on the ballot this year. In addition though, we should also have more opportunities to vote early. That some people like to vote uh, by mail every single election, that maybe that's just what's convenient for them. So other states have implemented things like allowing someone to be on a permanent uh, absentee vote list so that you get an absentee ballot each election unless you tell them you don't want it that election. And so it comes to you and you don't have to submit uh, applications every single election. Uh, additionally, we have prohibitions against um, early, uh, multiple early voting centers in a county. Um, here in Cuyahoga, we have 1.25 million people, and we uh, have one early voting site. That makes no sense, and it leads to long lines at the early voting centers. Uh, we should rescind that prohibition and allow people to use uh, early voting um, and have multiple locations across our counties. Thank you, uh, Mr. Parker. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right, let's go to uh, Ms. Winbish and uh, talk to you about, you mentioned something earlier about uh, folks being able to vote who have been incarcerated and their rights to vote and just getting them uh, up to speed as to their eligibility because oftentimes people believe incorrectly, I think, that because they have uh, served their time, paid their debt to society, that they are no longer eligible. Under what conditions are people eligible to vote when it comes to uh, having been incarcerated? And even if they're in jail or haven't been convicted, they can still vote depending upon the circumstance. Explain that to us a bit more. Yeah, so under Ohio law, um, basically, and if you are currently in prison for a felony conviction, you may not vote. So that means you are sitting in prison for, with a felony. Now, if you have a misdemeanor, or if you're in jail waiting for a trial, or you are on probation or parole, you can still vote. And a lot of people don't know that, or they've been told maybe by you know, someone in the jail system that they're not able to vote. Or back in 20, 2012, maybe you guys remember, there were those terrible billboards that said voter fraud is a crime, and it sort of insinuated that it, you know, if you have some sort of criminal background, that this is going to be held against you. Um, so this is, this is a myth. This is misinformation. And unfortunately, it holds people back from, from voting. And that's exactly what some of the powers that be want to do. They're trying to uh, make sure that people who are um, who have less power, who are underprivileged, um, can't stand up and take that, that power away from them. So that's certainly something we have to fix. What's the pushback on that then for this election? The pushback on prison? 
Well, so, you know, we are, um, there's a number, there's like, the ACLU has a toolkit, an organizer's toolkit that explains how community organizations can work um, with, with officials in the jails to do the jail voting. Um, there are a number of, you know, organizations like the Northeast Ohio Voter Advocates that is in particular who's been involved in doing that program that I'm certain would be happy to, you know, welcome volunteers. And then, of course, you know, there's, these voter education forums where we're relying on um, citizens to come to learn and to spread the word. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Judge Nelson, uh, your thoughts on, and you mentioned this too, about people uh, not thinking that it's important to vote and for those who will sit back and say, well, this is a midterm, it really doesn't matter. Uh, talk to us about why it does matter and efforts that you're aware of that get people to understand that every vote counts in every election. Well, I know, you know, local e efforts, including the ones you're hearing about tonight, but you have the souls to the polls, efforts in churches that needs to be expanded and it needs to be started earlier so we don't wait until a particular day to do it, but that we start promoting that as an event, as a community event with all kind of incentives. I remember during the last election, uh, uh, on the election day, uh, up leading up to election day, they had major activities down by the Board of Elections where people were actually that, of course it rained like cats and dogs, but up until the time it rained, you had a lot of activity around the Board of Elections, picnics, music, parties, all kinds of things. So you have, to, you have to go back and sort of look at what kind of efforts were used when people who were really being disenfranchised in the South, where you brought large groups of people into communities and that was the activity that was the activity. We have a number of street corners in our community where people gather and we look at them and drive quickly past them. I'm thinking of 131st and Harvard where there's a big group of people there. We could just send people there and just say, look, not only get them registered, but then go back to make them to the, take them to the polls. Uh, you know, you pray for good weather so that uh, those people who are gathering go to places where people are. We also need to try to push Ohio into become one of those automatic registration states. Uh, where, um, you know, I, I don't know how many there are now, but where it, instead of you, ha you are registered unless you decide you don't want to be registered, as opposed to you having to go get registered and getting purged. You know, you need to push the state. We also need to go to our Board of Elections. The issue that uh, was just talked about with these signs that, was, that were before, we have to go to our Board of Elections and challenge people who put those signs up at the Board of Elections and make sure while we're at the Board of Elections we get convince those boards of elections to put out clear and convincing evidence about who has the right to vote. So the questions uh, about uh, felons uh, being, because uh, we get this all the time about felons not being allowed to vote and we have to correct that all the time. So we go to our board of elections and say, look, we want you to make a statement that, uh, 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 and start the discussion at the board of elections about who has the right to vote. So they come out and then you can go out with your press conferences, get on your radio stations, you know, you use Sam Silk, use all those radio stations that have your TV station uh, to push public service announcements and integrate it right into the, if you have to spend a few dollars, integrate it right into the, uh, uh, to buy time on these stations to actually push voting rights and education and let felons know that you have a right to vote. And, and, and just push it out there as part of our normal course of conversation. All right. Thank you, sir. Just Appreciate a hand it. back there. Okay, what we're gonna do, if you have a question, Write it down. I have several here. That's the process we're going to use. If you have a question, write it down and we'll, we'll go from there. This is a good place for us to then start implementing that, getting the voices from the audience, and we appreciate the fact. Uh, whoever will take this, and this is the very first question we've had, what can we do to improve the power of the cities in the state legislature? I don't know uh, who wants to tackle that one. If nobody, we'll move on. But if you have something, and we if you could. Tax on home rule. And somehow we have, to we have to convince our legislatures. And I don't know when the last time the legislature served in this community had a town hall meeting. They may have had one recently. In fact, I believe, Angie, they did have a town hall meeting. About 12 people came to the town hall meeting. We have to, you know, look at this room. We're talking about the mo one of the most crucial rights you have. And and it, it, it's going to be put in place in a very, very short time, but we have so, we, we, the, the complacency and apathy, we have to attack that. But one of the things that really hurts cities is the attack on home rule. Uh, and if we could somehow get a reasonable legislature 
to uh, become act to, to, to go and start uh, arguing for uh, home rule in certain aspects, more home rule in certain aspects, that may help. All right, thank you. Anybody else want to res respond to that? If not, we'll move on to another question. Uh, I, I, I would. I would just add that I think the other thing that hurts the um, power of cities is our um, gerrymandered system. That when you have uh, districts that are gerrymandered that favor uh, more suburban, rural districts, um, and you uh, uh, put all of the uh, urban communities together into like one or just a couple districts, um, then you are going to have lopsided representation at the state house and in Congress. And so um, I, I think that uh, that is also a, a major component of what is on the ballot this year too, in that the folks that we will be electing into executive offices this year will um, have a hand in drawing the districts in 2020 and 2021. And so, um, you know, it's important for us to be engaged with that and to make sure that those are done in a fair way. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll move on to another question, and this one is, what is being done to engage youth future, basically the youth of our future, uh, voters to participate in the voting process? As I mentioned earlier, we often say that the children are our future, but what are we doing to make sure they're engaged in learning and participating now? So I can take part of that. So um, one thing people may be unaware of is that um, students can actually, 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds can actually be poll workers. Um, and Mike's got these great little poll worker recruitment little flyers here. Um, they can be poll workers and get, and get school credit for doing that. Um, and they're really helpful for a lot of the you know, older poll workers who aren't as comfortable with the voting machines. They learn about the process, and then they get sort of ingrained in the importance of voting. And um, you know, they say that once people, once young people start voting, they develop a culture of continuing to vote. So that's really important. Um, we talked about you know, possibly trying, trying to advocate for you know, the pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds so that when they show up at the BMV to get their driver's license, they're already um, in, uh, in the pipeline to, get, to be able to register when they turn 18. Um, we've got a number of um, organizations that are working on college campuses to make sure students on, you know, on college campuses are aware of how they can easily vote. Um, from their campus address, and so we've got to just work together and think about how we can how we can reach students because they are a huge swath of the population, and um, they're engaged. They're certainly an important voting block that we need to make sure that they're getting the information because they're inexperienced and they don't exactly know how these voting rules work, um, and so that's why we have to give them the voter tools to you know how what ID do you need to bring, where do you go vote, that kind of thing. All right. You know, there's an old uh, process that happens almost annually, take your child to work day. Why don't we take our children to the polls when we go vote? It's a learned process, and when they see you do it, and you, they tend to, to follow suit. They do as we do, not always as we say. Any parent knows that. Um, let me ask, uh, there is another question from the floor, and it says, please clarify, are actual absentee ballots sent to every registered voter or are absentee ballots request form sent to every voter? Or must each voter take the initiative to get an absentee ballot? So yeah, I can uh, handle that. Uh, so number one, uh, no, absentee ballot request forms are not sent to every registered voter. Um, if you are a voter who has missed uh, a, a federal election, and this goes back to the voter purging, um, you know, you are purged from the, from the voter registration list after six years or missing three federal elections. So if you didn't vote in 2012, 2014, and 2016, you might be purged after this election in 2018 because we didn't do any purging uh, the year before. Um, but what happens is, so if you missed 2016, you may have been placed on what's known as confirmation status, which means that uh, you missed an election and they don't consider you an active voter anymore. And so when the Secretary of State then sends out the mailing of all the absentee ballot applications that we all hopefully got if we're registered voters about a week or two ago, 
um, the, those individuals do not receive that absentee ballot application, which I think is a horrible thing that our Secretary of State does currently, um, because if we're talking about people that are infrequent voters that um, need to uh, vote to not be purged, we want to provide them with um, all the opportunities that any other voter would get, and that there's all sorts of reasons why somebody might miss an election. Maybe they were ill, they had a family emergency, who knows? Um, but uh, no, they don't. Not not everyone gets an absentee ballot application with the um, uh, pre-registration list or with the list for absentee ballots, the permanent list. That would the, in those states, those individuals are placed on a list where they don't then have to send in a absentee ballot request form. But the Board of Elections or the Secretary of States in those uh, state in those states knows to automatically send them that ballot each and every election unless they say, no, actually, I want to go in on election day or I'm not going to vote on this election. Anybody else want to address you know, that? One of the things that I think Angie talks about all the time is the percentage of actual registered voters that participate. Because that's, that's, it's not only just the percentage of the community that's uh, eligible, it's actually the percentage of those who are registered who just opt out. Now, I was reading uh, Denver, Colorado, which had a tremendous turnout uh, over 70 percent of the residents of Denver. And I don't know if Denver, Denver, if it's the county or if it's just the city, but over 70 percent of the people in Denver voted. And in Denver, everybody that's registered gets a ballot mailed to them. So, you know, that's why I'm saying we have to go to our Board of Election and make them more uh, customer friendly, I guess is a good word for it. If they send out, the, uh, you know, everybody gets a ballot. And then you can choose whether you want to send it back in or not, and you can vote by mail or home or however you want to do that. But uh, you know that, that, that's the other issue, making sure that those who are responsible uh, take, even though we always talk about personal responsibility, I mean, we do pay taxes and you know, we, can, we can ask our institutions to be much more proactive in making sure that, uh, that their primary duty, which is promoting voting, that they actually promote voting. So that's another thought that we can do in order to increase the percentage. And you, Harry, you talked about young people. Young, it's a very interesting thing here. Every school, every fall has a what contest? Homecoming, king, and queen. And it's usually a voting contest. So our young people, I guess, I don't know, how, some, how can we make the connection between that and the largest civic response because they vote every year, at least every fall on the homecoming king and queen. So how can we transition that enthusiasm to uh, voting in, 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 in elections outside of school? What's interesting about that is um, in California, mm -hmm. uh, in Orange County, uh, they actually have the boards of election uh, go into all of the high schools, and they do uh, they, they bring in the equipment, they show how it works, and then they uh, actually run their homecoming elections and allow the students to have fellowships with the boards of elections all of that kind of stuff. So if you look at Orange County, it's something like half of all of their poll workers are actually high school students. Um, so it's been incredibly effective to get young people really engaged with the uh, system and to see how voting works on a, on a really basic on the ground level. All right. Thank you. Uh, speaking of that, uh, what are your rights if you think you are unfairly denied a ballot at your polling place and are poll workers well trained here in the state of Ohio? So um, everyone has a right to a provisional ballot. Um, you should never walk away from a polling place feeling like I wasn't allowed to vote. Um, that's why we have the 866-OUR vote hotline um, for people to call who have questions about um, their experiences at the polls so they can get help. Um, so. The, the deal is a provisional ballot. Some people may be confused about what exactly a provisional ballot is or why I was asked to vote one. Um, it's just a, basically a backup paper ballot um, that if the poll worker has a question about your eligibility, so maybe you're, they're not, they don't see you in the poll book, or maybe the poll book says you requested an absentee ballot, and here you are at the polls. 
Um, maybe you didn't bring the right type of ID. You didn't bring a driver's license. You didn't have a utility bill. So they'd have you fill out a provisional ballot. The most important thing to do, well, right now, here, what is today, September 27th, the most important thing for everyone to do today is to check the registration to status to make sure it's up to date. If it's up to date and the Board of, registration, Board of Elections has that information, you will get a regular ballot. For folks who do not check their registration um, after, you know, after October 10th, um, and if they've moved, they may have to vote provisionally. And, um, but that's okay, that just means they'll just sort of sort out the paperwork after the election, but everyone should feel, um, uh, feel that they have the right to vote a provisional ballot no matter what. Oh yes, you can check it, you can check your registration online, you can go to myohiovote.com to check your registration. And then for the poll worker training, you know, poll workers are expected to be on the job from six in the morning to eight o'clock, maybe 8.30, maybe nine o'clock at night. A lot of them are you know, older. Um, they're sitting in uncomfortable chairs. Maybe they got a 30 minute break. Um, and they're getting training maybe once a year if they are coming you know, regularly. Maybe it's every four years. And it's a huge poll worker manual. So we're expecting a lot out of people. Um, but that's not to say that our elections aren't important and they shouldn't get it right. Um, so we're sort of, it's kind of a, a two-way street that we are hoping that we get out the word so everyone understands their rights as voters, but that if poll workers do something, they, if they make a mistake, that um, we can call them on their mistakes and get it fixed with the Board of Elections. Hey, let me ask you a question. Uh, may I ask, let me ask a question. Do we have any uh, registration packets here tonight? We do? Okay. One of the things I think that is a real challenge, and I think we can do this if each one of the people here do the, uh, I think the National NACP has this five, get five, five, or something like that. Is that what it's called, Angie or uh, Kayla? And that means each one of us take five registration packages and register or confirm that our neighbors, people around us, at least five of them are either registered, have the proper change of addresses. So at the end of the day, if we, each one of you would just take five and commit to get five between now and the, what's the early registration date? October 10th, register them, and then take them down and have them vote. But at least register them and get the stuff turned in. If each, and that, you know, that increases our numbers. This, this small group can really increase the number of people that, um, that uh, Okay, well get what you can get, and then you can get them, you can get, get them downtown, so you can become a deputy, yeah, yeah. and you can, uh, dep you can become a deputy registrar now, you want me to explain that process real quick about how, if, is that's, if that's even required now? You don't have to do that, anyone okay. can help someone fill out a voter registration form. Good. Good. Yeah, I was about to ask if that was a requirement, that you had to have special training or some yeah. kind of certification. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from the floor, and thank you for these questions. How is social media being used to encourage people to vote, and what uh, websites can voters view to research issues and candidates? Um, well, so one of the uh, best resources, I think, for issues and candidates is the League of Women Voters Guide, um, that they are strictly nonpartisan um, and give you uh, just, just the facts. Uh, so if you need to look at uh, up information, of, there's gonna be uh, 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 one constitutional amendment on uh, our ballots. There may be some local uh, races that the local chapters um, outline uh, and also have information about candidates. I think also checking um, your local newspaper, um, uh, cleveland.com oftentimes posts um, the, not just the actual endorsements, but they've been uh, posting also just the endorsement interviews. So you can watch firsthand what the uh, different candidates say in response to different questions. And then I think also hooking up with the legal women voters and going to forums, uh, they're doing candidate nights so that you can uh, go there directly and hear from the candidates um, and actually ask the questions that you want to ask. You know, sometimes I listen to uh, one of those endorsement 
uh, interviews or um, I uh, see a commercial from a, a particular candidate and I'm like, they're not talking about anything that I actually care about. And um, I want to know about X, Y, and Z. No better way to uh, find out the answer to those questions than to go to your local forum and actually ask the question. The other way you can do is call the candidate. Mm -hmm. Call the candidate. For example, with the judicial races, you want to know what the candidate's position is on bail bond reform. You want to know uh, what their background is on, on the issues that are important to you, the civil rights, police brutality, whatever the issue is. Women's rights, the women's rights that you ask them, call them and ask. And when you call them and ask them, they will give you answers that they won't give in a form because they are totally caught off guard when you call them and ask them. <laughs> if you call a candidate and say, look, uh, candidate Nelson, um, I saw you running and uh, what's your position on uh, bail bond reform? And see what they can't give you because they, they're not ready for that. And you probably would get a much cleaner, more honest answer, or you get a lot of stuttering, one or the other. So, yeah. Well, the, the, the only thing I'd add to, to that is the benefit of asking them in a forum is mm -hmm. that a hundred other people hear their answer, right? And so then they are on the record with what they think about bail bond reform or whatever else, too. Do both things. Do it all. Do it all. All of the above. <laughs> all right. Well, you can call to the. Usually, there's a number on the uh, on the candidate's literature. You know, there's a number on the candidate's literature, and you let them know that you represent, you represent whatever street you live. In. I represent Belvoir Boulevard, and you know they don't know whether you represent Belvoir Boulevard or not. But uh, you know, I represent Belvoir Belvoir Boulevard, and then this is the question I have for you. And I want your candidate to call me and and tell me that, uh, tell me to answer that question. So. All right, thank you. Here is another question, and uh, I don't know. Wh let me just ask it. And so what can be done to reduce the influence of money in politics? I guess given Citizens United, not a whole lot, but anybody want to address that? So, so my organization is working with the Fair Courts Working Group to look at how we can do just that. And one of the proposals we're thinking, we're trying to talk, we've done a lot of community forums, and um, one of the issues is you know, people don't even understand that judges can hear the cases of their contributors, and they're, they're not required to disqualify themselves for that. Um, and you know, the judicial canons say judges should avoid even the appearance of impropriety. So um, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't make people feel good when they think, oh, well, the person that I'm going up against at court, maybe they gave a really big check to that judge, and I didn't. And that makes people think, oh, I'm not going to get my fair day at court, right? That's what everyone is growing up hearing, like, you get your day in court. Um, so we're looking at the ideas of lifting up um, what we call recusal, making judges disqualify themselves um, if they do have a conflict of interest. And then the disclosure is important too because we need to know, you know who is actually giving to these candidates. Um, there is Citizens United, but Ohio law says they just haven't updated our laws. Um, they could, if we wanted to, um, require uh, special interest groups to disclose who is giving to those groups. And that would help us to at least have an idea of who, when you see ads on TV saying, you know, Judge Judy lets rapists and murderers go free, paid for by citizens for the children. I don't know who these people are. I don't know who's influencing. I don't know if it's Russia. I don't know if it's people in, you know, California who's giving to this candidate who's trying to get this judge not to run. So, you know, these issues of, you know, transparency and um, is, is really important to our democracy. So I'm hoping that we can, we can make some strides in that. All right, thank you very much. Uh, another couple of questions here, and this one, uh, they apologize for the long question, but what words of encouragement do you have for young people who are looking at the issues, voting based on what they think is best in a nonpartisan way, but are being bullied or de demeaned, told their votes don't matter, or things uh, went wrong because they didn't vote with a, special, with a specific party? Uh, this can be extremely discouraging uh, coming from family. So I don't want anybody want to address that? That sounds like a tough situation. I mean, um, first of all, people's 
the, whether, you not, whether or not you vote is a public record, but who you vote for is private. So that's your choice for who you vote for. Um, I would say, you know, absolutely, it's important that you vote your conscience to do your, uh, to do your work, to look up ca the candidates that support your views and your values and vote for them. Um, but, you d yeah, you gotta stick to your guns. Yeah, and, and, and I think too, um, you know, I, of course, working for an organization that works to expand the franchise and get as many people to be able to vote, um, who are eligible to vote, who want to vote, um, you know, I, I, I would love everybody in the United States to vote every single election. Um, I also know that our system is not um, always built for that. Um, that, uh, in fact, um, there are multiple obstacles that keep people from sometimes uh, casting their ballot. But that also when we talk about like people not feeling engaged or like the people in Washington, D.C. or Columbus aren't hearing them, that that's also based off of the structure of the system. That in Ohio and in many other states, we have a gerrymandered system that doesn't represent what the actual individuals in the states and in the communities actually believe and uh, want to uh, achieve uh, from their legislators. And so it's very easy for a young person, or frankly, any person, to become very jaded and disillusioned with the government. But if anything, you know, the victory from um, the folks with issue one in May um, shows that the people can take back the power and that we have an opportunity now with this election and the elections coming forward to uh, put people in positions who will uh, draw fair and competitive maps and to set down the framework to better engage people for a long period of time. And we're all part of that, whether you're young, old, uh, or rural or urban or anywhere else uh, in the state of Ohio, it's important to show up. All right, thank you. I have uh, the last two questions that I want to talk about, a couple of issues you mission, mentioned, issue one, I want to get to what that is. But uh, I'm going to combine these two because they're very similar. How can we get candidates to the forums? And how do we introduce candidates to people who don't uh, usually vote in the midterms? Uh, how do we make them uh, relatable and get them out to uh, talk to the people or the people to talk to them? You know, candidates show up where there's a history that the people that host the forum are voters. If you go to Ward 1 in Cleveland, high voter turnout, people go to Ward 1. So if, if and, and, and that's where their fate place their emphasis. And it's also the emphasis of how they spend their money, too. They spend their money where pockets of people are likely to vote. Cleveland Heights, high voter turnout, people turn out for Cleveland Heights forms. Um, and that is also how services are delivered. If your community has a high voter turnout record, then services, city services, and other services come to your community. Uh, but we have to make sure that we connect people with the, uh, let them know that the, the, the political game will go on whether they play it or not. You know, it, the game doesn't stop because you don't play. This one, and if you don't play, then people will make decisions for you. And we have to make sure people are connected and understand that uh, your failure to protect your own franchise gives that power to somebody else who may not even like you. So somehow we have to make that, you know, use our marketing people. If, you can, if we can get people to buy cigarettes with the thing on it, this will kill you. We ought to be able to market voting in the same way so that people would take advantage of something that's going to benefit them. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. I want to go back and touch on something that, uh, that Mike talked about, and that was issue one. Uh, and explain what issue one is. As my understanding, it is to reduce or eliminate, uh, eliminate uh, nonviolent sentencing when it comes to drug laws or drug offenses. Uh, explain what issue one is and, and what we can do. And also, I want to talk briefly, if I can get you to address these issues uh, briefly, each of them, the gubernatorial um, candidates that are running uh, and those that are running for Senate, the Ohio Attorney General, and the Secretary of State. These are all important offices that are up on November 6th. So let's talk first about issue one, what that is, and why it is important that we get engaged. 
Mike, you can go ahead and I'll support that. The other two here, I have to withdraw from. I'll go sit out there in the audience because I can't express, <laughs> I can't express a, a partisan opinion about the candidates. Okay. That, right. That's a violation of the canons. And Angie's always afraid that I'm, a, I'm always on the edge of the canons when it comes to politics, so I will. Well, we know you're a passionate brother, Mike. Yeah, and, I, and I think all of us working for nonpartisan organizations aren't going to be endorsing uh, any Issue, candidates yeah, up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, oh, first thing I wanted to say, too, was in relation to um, having the candidates relate to, like, the people. And this relates to what I said earlier about people not feeling engaged with their elected officials. So I'd also say to people who feel like they aren't able to engage with their elected official is maybe you should become an elected official, right? That it, maybe it shouldn't just be the same old people with the same old last names running for every single seat uh, in Cuyahoga County, right? Oh, so, I, I <laughs> yes, you can go uh, ahead. Let me say this very quickly. Because that's, that, see that NACP table over there? We have an election coming up. And what he just said is so important. Our NACP has been run by people that are... 90 years old, and it's we have some young people. Stand up back there, folks. Stand up there, all the people back here. Stand up, You're Kayla and Angie, uh, Charlotte, and, 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 and Angie, stand up a minute. Angie, stand up a minute. They are all under 70. <laughs> now, I'm not saying all the 70 year olds are bad, but we're trying to encourage. So, the membership for the NACP, France is our membership person, she is looking, working so hard to get young people involved. It's only that we're not an elitist organization. It costs $30 to join. It's not all black people, if you know the history of the NACP. So at the end of this meeting, I want you to go over there, give her $30, get your membership, because we have an election coming up, and it's important that we keep this momentum so that events like this and, you know, the other events we've been doing, because that was not historically, the recent history of the NACP is that's not been going on, and we've been able to revitalize that. So we want to keep that going. Now let me get back yeah, to yeah, you. No, no. Uh, <laughs> but so important, right, to take action yourself. And if you don't see yourself represented, then maybe you should be a candidate. On um, issue one, so issue one on the ballot this November uh, does, as Harry said, tackle um, our uh, criminal justice system and specifically drug laws. Um, what it would do is it would reclassify uh, most uh, low-level felony offenses. So these are typically called F4 or F5 felonies um, having to do with drug possession. And it would reclassify them to uh, mis misdemeanors. Um, if you look at our state prison system, we have uh, nearly 50,000 people in state prison right now. Um, we spend um, over a billion dollars uh, in our state budget on just our correction system alone. Um, so we spend a lot of money. We lock up a lot of people. Many of those people are low-level, nonviolent uh, drug offenders. And um, it's not really working in our state. We're spending an awful lot of money on our prisons that we could be putting into our schools, into our roads, into our healthcare. And um, if you look at the human cost where people have criminal convictions and they follow them for the rest of their lives or they're unable to get housing or a job or education and so they end up back in that cycle of incarceration. Um, and we look at what's going on in our communities with overdoses right now, where uh, we just saw the numbers from last year. We had over 4,000 people in the state of Ohio who overdosed. Um, we are the Montgomery County in Dayton. That's the overdose capital of the country right now here in Ohio. Are, and oh, died or oh, overdose and died. Fa yeah. Fatal overdoses. It's just not overdosing, overdose deaths. And yeah, yes, thank you. Um, so over 4,000 overdose deaths in the state of Ohio. And so, you know, what, we're do what, what, what we are doing now, this war on drugs, um, it's been a, instead a war on certain communities, and it has uh, relied on enforcement-heavy policing, and it has decimated a lot of our communities. And so issue one would change the uh, uh, felony classification to a misdemeanor. It would also take cost savings uh, uh, that is achieved from that because people would not be in uh, state prison any longer. It would take that and reinvest it back into the communities uh, so that they could have 
uh, more drug rehabilitation, mental health care, um, and other services that would hopefully help to prevent a lot of the uh, uh, drug issues or and, and other criminal issues in our communities. Um, so that's essentially what uh, issue one would, would do. Now, we, the, now the, the thing about issue one, the municipal judges, the prosecutors, the criminal defense association, every um, organization associated with law enforcement is against issue one. Now, the, that, that's the organizations. There are specific municipal judges who sort of see how this thing has really worked who are for issue one. I happen to be one of them. Uh, the, it's aimed, and they're giving you these, 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 these scare taxes. We're gonna have drug traffickers. It's aimed at users. It's drug possession, not traffickers, possession. And they talk about the number of doses of fentanyl that would still be on the classified as a misdemeanor. It is users, not traffickers. And we've focused, combined the two so many so so long that we sort of lose sight of that. The other thing that they say, well, there'll be no enforcement policy. Well, if a person violates three times, then they can be held, okay, because it moves from misdemeanor to felony. So there's, so all these scare, look behind the language so you can fare through the scare tax. The other is they'll tell you that some outsiders did it. Well, the outsiders did it because our legislature, in their, with their lack of vision, refused to do anything about this matter. So now they've gotten religion now, and they're saying, well, it was us, some outsiders are coming here and forcing this on us. Well, that's because they failed to do anything for decades for decades. So our prison system has exploded, families have been separated, lives have been destroyed because people were getting incarcerated. They lost all their benefits, job opportunities, and everything else because they were incarcerated for possession, possession cases. So, uh, so for, and it gave, sometimes it's good to give a judge discretion, but oftentimes the, <laughs> The, 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 the fours would be incarcerated. Then they violate their probation, proba probation because they relapse. Well, that's, they were addicted. That's what addicted people do, they relapse. You try to get them some help, but they would jail them as opposed to treat them. So issue one is very important for us turning this state around. Don't be, you know, look behind the scare tactics. Well, thank you very much on that. Um, just uh, in regards to the opioid uh, um, problem, in 2017, there were 31,000 deaths in America due to the opioid epidemic, 31,000. In 2017, there were 36,000 people who died from flu in America, the flu. But we don't see the hysteria. I see a couple of posters telling me not on 65 to get a double dose of the flu vaccine, um, but, uh, you know, 36,000. In 2017, 480,000 people died because of smoking and smoking-related illnesses. 480,000 in one year in America, all right? Over 680,000 die from heart disease every year in America. Folks, there's a lot of things that we have to hold our politicians and people responsible for but we have to also be responsible ourselves to make sure that they do what we want them to do and not what they're being paid to do by the various interest groups around the country. Those folks who spend the big bucks who are now unable to spend unlimited amounts of money because of Citizens United. Um, thank you very much. I want to give each of our panelists and want to thank them uh, a, a, an opportunity to make a closing comment, maybe a minute, maybe two, and then we'll uh, We'll wrap up, but thank you very much. So, Mr. Brickney, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, absolutely. I, I feel like everybody in this room probably is registered to vote and is planning to go vote. So, again, I would challenge you to think about what else are you going to do beyond just voting? Um, so, register to be a poll worker. We have these cards over here. If you can't be a poll worker, take some. They're over there. You can get my business card. I'll send some to you. I've got plenty of them. Uh, encourage other people to be a poll worker. And also, take this literature about um, what we can do to make our voting system better. And then take it to your next uh, forum for your candidates. Ask your legislators. Ask your city council members. Ask your secretary of state candidates what are you doing to make voting easier in our state? Because we can do it, and this is the path to, to do it. All right, Ms. Wimley. 
So obvi obviously, you guys all care about voting. That's why you're all here. But your charge is to go f talk to your neighbor and your friends and your kids about what's important to them. If they say they don't want to vote, ask them why. Ask them what's important to them. Try to dig deeper. Um, because I imagine that after two or three questions, you're going to get to an issue that they care about, and you'll be able to point to someone who's running for an office that would actually have influence over that issue. Um, again, if, you're, if we really need help with um, monitoring the polling locations this year, so if you are interested in being a poll monitor, you could just be two or three hours. We get you trained. Um, and you would be able to help voters who may have questions, who may get turned around, or may get bad information from a poll worker, make sure that they're actually able to cast their ballot. Because that's, that's the key here, is making sure that everyone who actually turned out is able to um, get their voice heard at the ballot box. So thank you. I'm going to encourage you in my one minute to come to the NAACP meeting, which is going to be held on Tuesday, next Tuesday, October 2nd, where issue one will be one of the major topics. I think there'll be both people from both sides of the issue. Uh, and it's at the University Circle, United Methodist Church. It's protected parking uh, at the University, University Circle, United Methodist Church, 7 o'clock on Tuesday. And there'll be a, a, a significant discussion. I think Shakira Diaz, who's pro issue one, Right. So you want to have here a spirited debate come to that meeting on the, uh, and there'll be some other things that um, will be going on, and, and you can actually be, get involved in your, uh, in your uh, Cleveland NAACP, which includes Cleveland Heights and everywhere around here. Okay? That's at 7 o'clock at University Circle United Methodist Church. The date is Tuesday, October the 2nd. Okay? All right, bring your friends, bring your friends, and there's no cost to get into it. We hope we might hold you hostage till you get a membership before you get out, but anyway. Judge, thank okay. you very much. Pardon me? Where, where would you University Circle United Methodist Church, that big church with the blue roof down right in the circle. Pardon me? Yeah, the oil can. Yeah, yeah, exactly. right. We all know that can. one, right? <laughs> the oil can. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. Are you, are you? And we thank each of you for your questions and for your being here this evening. I'd like to thank uh, the folks from the Northeast Ohio Voter Advocates, NOVA, as well as the folks who helped put all this together, uh, the Alpha Omega Foundation, the NAACP Cleveland Chapter, CWRU, Lifelong Learning, the League of Women Voters, the Greater Cleveland Chapter, and of course our host, the Heights Public Libraries. We thank you very much. Uh, don't forget that it is important that you not only come here tonight, but after you leave here tonight, what are you going to do then? Uh, when you wake up tomorrow morning and you see something on TV or hear something on radio or read something in the newspaper or online that you disagree with, what are you going to do then? Are you going to say, well, I went to that meeting last night, and is that going to be all you're going to do? Or are you going to step up and get involved in a greater way? Uh, no matter what your politics, it is important that you understand the importance of your vote. If your vote did not matter, folks would not be trying to take it away from you. Because people don't want anything that is of no value. If they try and take it from you, no matter who that is, and throughout history there have been Democrats and Republicans who have done uh, voter suppression poll taxes and literacy tests and things like that. It was George Wallace back in the 60s. It was a Democrat, and now it may be Republicans. It, 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 it wanes, it goes here and there, it varies. So just keep in mind, there's always a fight that we have to keep on fighting. Too many have died, too many have bled, and too many have stood in the breach for us to sit back and not get involved. So I thank you very much for having me. Mike, thank you very much for having me. The League of Women Voters, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and to be a part of this. Uh, go tonight and be well, drive safely, and vote November 6th. Thank you.